Hi, it is a privilege to be with all of you today. You know, I have a deep, uh, special place in my heart for Christ Church. And uh, I love what this church stands for. I love the amazing work that you guys are doing in, in Lake Forest and, and, and outside of, of your community in North Chicago, but also to the ends of the earth. I admire the great work that you guys are doing, and you have a very, very special place in my heart. And it's, it's an honor to be here with all of you today. No, I, I've asked during these difficult times, I've asked people, what do you want in life? And, and I've come to, to the conclusion that, that actually most of us, what, what we really want in life is actually different than what we think we want in life. We, we may think that we want something, but in reality, our hearts and, and, and our souls are longing for something else. You know, a lot of people answer money to that question. What, what do you really want in life? I, I want money. And, you know, that, that's not bad. It, it, it solves problems. It, it, it can save time. Uh, but is that, is that really the ultimate desire that you have for life? Uh, some people say, hey, I just want to be married. And, hey, that's, that's great. You know, that, that can be good until it's not right? Uh, some people say, I just want to be happy. And that, that, that's not a bad goal, uh, but it's, it's based on what's happening. So therefore, what needs to happen in order for you to be happy? So that's very fluid. Uh, so what I've come to learn is that we don't really pay attention to our hearts and our souls to say, what do we really want in life? And what I've come to realize is that for the large majority of us, especially during this time, during the, the, the difficult things that we have seen and the difficult things that we're facing, is that I really believe that what most of us long for and what most of us want is peace, shalom. See, you can have money in the bank and not have peace in your heart. You can be successful outwardly, but feel empty inwardly. You, you, you can be married and have absolutely no peace. And what's interesting is, as, as the angels announce the Christ of, of, I mean, the birth of Christ, right? What, what, what they said was, peace on earth. Now, what does that mean? Is, is, is all of earth now at peace because Jesus is here? And what it was saying is that, that peace, Jesus is on earth. It's here. And what's interesting is that as Jesus interacted with people, he would tell people, peace be with you, or go in peace. As, as Paul would write on, on the epistles, he, he would write and, 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 and say goodbye to the people. He would say, grace and peace be with you. Well, well that's interesting, right? I mean, if we think about that, grace and peace, really? I mean, I can understand the grace because we definitely need grace, but why would he say peace? I, th I think in our, in our current culture, we, we would have a, a better saying for that. Instead of peace, we would probably replace it with, with, with grace and power be with you. Grace and riches be with you. Grace and fame be with you. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says, grace and peace. Shalom. You know... <laughs> I think we want peace. We desire peace, internal peace that allows that peace to overflow into peace with others, peace with ourselves, peace with God, peace regardless of circumstances. I want peace, but, but what I've come to, to realize is that, that, that many times what we see is not peace, but but what we're feeling is actually tension and fear and anxiety. And in relationships, we want peace. But what we see is, is that with our friends and with our families, there's actually misunderstanding and there's disagreement and there's hurt feelings and there's unforgiveness. So what do we really want in life? I want to make a case that a lot of us, we're longing for peace and don't even know it. 
Now, you may be asking yourself, well, well, what are you talking about? I mean, is it even possible under the current circumstances that we're living to even have peace, to live in peace? Right, with, with all the racial uh, division, the political division, and the list goes on and on of reasons why we can't live in peace. Is it possible to have shalom, to have peace with God, with others, with ourselves, regardless of circumstances? I want us to take a look at Isaiah 26. Let me give you a little bit of context of what's going on here. Because... In, 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 in chapter 26, we see that, that this is a season for, for the people of Israel of fear and unsettledness. It, it is a difficult time, far greater, worse than what we're currently living. And here the prophet Isaiah speaks, and he speaks of, of a different day. And it's a beautiful, beautiful description. It's a beautiful promise or a beautiful prophecy. Verses 1 through 4 say this. It says, In that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. Our city is strong. We are surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Open the gates to all who are righteous. Allow the faithful to enter. And, and here's the verse I want us to look at. It's, 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 it's so intriguing. It says, verse 3, it says, You will keep in perfect peace. You will keep in perfect peace, all who trust in you. And check it out. Here, here, here's a powerful part. It says, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Look at that. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is eternal. Is the eternal rock. I, I, I love this, 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 this promise in Isaiah. It says that you will be kept in perfect peace. I love that. See, but, but I think we're more familiar with imperfect peace. I don't know if you can relate to that, right? Because I could be in a, in a place where, where I'm good, right? I'm, I'm good. I'm feeling good. I'm trusting God. And then all of a sudden something happens and I'm like, God, where, where are you? Where are you? Is this imperfect peace? But we're promised to be kept in perfect peace. Now, the word shalom, let me, let me just give you the description here. It's up on, on the screen for you. It, you. You probably heard this word before. You, you probably know it. It's, it's wholeness. It means completeness. It means full of peace. It was, it was actually so important to the Jewish culture that that was their greeting, shalom. Right? It, 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 it meant that you have peace with God, that you have peace with others, that you have peace with self, and that you have peace regardless of circumstances. A complete peace. Now, what's interesting, so interesting about this verse in, in, in Isaiah is that actually where it says that, he, that, that we will be kept in perfect peace is actually the word shalom twice. So the way that they translate it, it says perfect peace. But, but in the Hebrew, it's actually that, that you will be kept in shalom, shalom. So the word is there double. It's like it's saying that you will be kept in a double portion of peace. Now, I need to be clear, though. Because peace doesn't mean that there's no troubles. Peace doesn't mean that there's no problems, right? That, that nothing is going to break, that your kids will never fight, that your spouse is not going to get upset at you because you did the dishes so badly, right? Or that there is intention between the two of you. No, no, peace is God's presence. So, 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 so let, 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 me, let me give it to you this way, and I, and I hope that you can write this down, and I hope that you can wrestle with this. And it's up on the screen, and it says, it says it, it, that peace isn't found in the absence of problems, but that true peace, shalom, shalom, is found in the presence of God. True peace, shalom, is found in the presence of God, not in the absence of problems. And there is nothing that brings us into the presence of God more than prayer. See, peace is God's presence. It's God's perspective. It's God's awareness. And the only way that we can have that is if we have a robust and authentic and real 
rhythm of prayer in our lives, even in the middle of problems. I mean, that's why 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 and 18 tells us this. It says, it says, it says pray continually, right? I mean, that sounds a lot like Isaiah. He's saying, for those whose thoughts are fixed on God, right, they will have peace. Well, here Paul is giving us a different twist on it. He's saying, pray continually. Look at verse 18. It says, give thanks, that's a form of prayer, in all circumstances. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand, though. I mean, not, how, how can I give thanks on the, under this current circumstance? No, no, no. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Man, that sounds a lot like Isaiah, right? You will be kept in perfect peace, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And here's Paul telling us, Pray continually. And at this point, you're probably wondering, what, 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 you, you, you mean peace when my marriage is horrible? You, you, you mean peace when my kids are using drugs? You mean peace when I have been betrayed, when my body hurts in the, in the midst of a pandemic, when, when I am sick, when I can't pay the bills? How could I possibly have peace during these circumstances? Well, let me just tell you, and it's up on the screen for you. See, the battle for peace begins in our mind. That's why Isaiah says, hmm, you will be kept in perfect peace for those whose thoughts are on God. That's why Paul tells us, pray continually. See, anyone else got a war going on in their mind? Because I don't know about you, but for me many times, man, I, I believe God. I believe God with all my heart. I believe what scripture says. And, and, and I believe the promises that he has for you. I just have a hard time sometimes believing those are actually for me too. But it starts in our minds. It starts in the way that we think, in the way that we're constantly allowing our mind to be absorbed either in prayer or worries, whether it's God or whether it's circumstances. Let me give you a different version of that same verse that we saw in Isaiah. This is the New Living Translation. It actually, instead of thoughts, they translate it in a different way, which is very accurate. It says, it says verse 3, it says, you will, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds, whose minds are steadfast. Notice Isaiah doesn't say perfect peace for all those who, 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 who fix their minds on CNN. Perfect peace for all those who fix their minds on Fox News, right? Perfect peace for, for those that, that, that are fixed on the future. The perfect peace for those whose thoughts are, are, are fixed on financial problems or on the bad news that you got from the doctors. No, no, no. And those whose thoughts, whose mind is fixed on God. And, and, and the word here, fix, in the Hebrew, in this passage, it's, 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 it's so beautiful. It's the word samak, and it's up on the screen for you. It, it means to lean on completely. It means to fully rest oneself. So in other words, it's that you will be kept in perfect peace when your mind is leaning on God. Right? A perfect peace when, 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 when your thoughts are resting on the unfailing promises of God. Perfect peace when we have a constant life of prayer. So let me ask you this question then. And this is an important question. In the midst of all that we're living, in the midst of everything that we're experiencing, in the midst of how we look at the future, let me ask you this question. And that is, what's your mind fixed on? What is your mind fixed on? Because I say as this, that for those that have perfect peace are those that have their thoughts fixed on God. Paul tells us pray continually. So, so, so what's fixed on your mind? Is it financial worries? What, 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 what is it that, that consumes your mind? Where does your mind drift to? What, what, what does your mind automatically focus on? 
Is it political division? Is it future fears? Is it what's going wrong? Is it, is it, is it what could go wrong? Is it what you don't like or, 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 or what you dread? What, what, what is your mind fixed on? This is what Philippians 4 verses 8 and 9 says. He tells us what to fix our thoughts on. It says, fix your thoughts. And this is all over scripture, right? Those whose thoughts are fixed on God, pray continually, right? And here we have Paul once again say, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And then look at, take a look at what it says. It says, then, then the God of peace will be with you. Wow. All over scripture, it connects what our minds are fixed on and the peace of God. And prayer, prayer is the primary way in which our minds can be fixed on God. Right? That, that, that's remind ourselves, my, 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 my God is good. Right? His promises are true. His word never fails. He, he never leaves me. He never forsakes me. When I am lost, he is my guide. When I am weak, he is my strength. When I am hurting, he is my comforter. Right? Nothing can possibly separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. This is a peace that won't make sense for those of us without Christ. Because this is what Jesus said. He said this in John chapter 14. He said, he said, peace, I leave with you. Peace. And, and, then, and then he tells us even something more shocking. He says, he, he doesn't just say that he leaves peace with us. He says, my peace, I give you. My peace. The peace of God. Right? Jesus' peace. My peace I give you. And I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Jesus said, my peace I give you. My shalom I give you. Not just a peace, but his peace. Now, it's interesting to see when did Jesus give this promise. And he gave this promise in John chapter 14, the night before his suffering. He knew what was coming. He knew, in fact, he knew so well that he actually asked for this cup to be taken from him if it was possible. And yet it is in, in, in the midst of all of that context that Jesus gives us this promise that his peace is with us and that our hearts should not be troubled. Isaiah says that we will be kept in perfect peace. Those whose minds are fixed on him. Those who have a consistent rhythm of being in communion through prayer with God. You know, Praising God when things are easy is <laughs> it's, it's easy to do. It, it, it's easy when we have a peaceful, easy feeling about us and, 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 and we worship God. But that, that's not real praise. It's not. See, real praise is in the middle of the storm. Real praise is when we can give thanks under all circumstances. Because we are continually in prayer. In fact, let's take a look at the verses right before those that we read in Philippians. We read verses 8 and 9. Let's actually take a look at verses 6 and 7 because they're so important. It says, do not be anxious about anything, about anything. But in every situation, by prayer, <laughs> by prayer... And petition, which is another form of prayer. With thanksgiving, which is another form of prayer. Present your request, which is another form of prayer, 
to God. Then after doing that, take a look at how beautiful this is. That not to be anxious, but in everything in prayer, bring it before God. Our petitions, our thanksgiving, our hurts, our wants, our desires, everything, all of who we are, bring it before God. And then take a look at the promise in verse 7. It says, and the peace of God, not, not, not regular peace, not circumstantial peace, the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, that peace, says, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, what's so beautiful about this verse is that now we're in the New Testament, we're in the Greek, and, 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 and that Greek word there for guard is actually a military term when, when a soldier would take post. So it's actually saying that if we live a life of prayer in which we're bringing our petitions, if we're giving our thanksgiving, if we're just constantly bringing our thoughts, our minds, our hurts, our desires, our celebrations, everything to God, Right? It, it actually says that if we live a life of prayer, that the peace of God will post guard and protect our hearts and our minds. That's why it begins by saying, be anxious about nothing. Because if we live a life of prayer, the peace of God will actually protect our hearts and protect our minds from anxiety and from fear. And we offer not just peace, but shalom, complete peace, a peace that allows us to be at peace with God, with others. Even if they're not at peace with us, we can be at peace with them, to be at peace with ourselves and to have peace regardless of the circumstances. It's the peace of God, not, not this world's peace that is so fragile, Right? The world can give it to us, and the world can take it from us. When our thoughts are fixed on God, when we pray continually, it means that our thoughts have now become prayers of God. Now, what's interesting is that we, 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 we talk a lot about prayer and that we should pray and all that, and, and, and we make it so much harder and it actually has to be. Uh, there's so many ways in which we can keep our thoughts fixed on God through prayer. You know, from the moment that our eyes wake up, it is an opportunity every morning that as soon as our eyes are open, that we can acknowledge God and surrender the day right there. Before we ever touch the floor, before we ever, ever, definitely before we ever touch our phones, <laughs> that we can surrender our day and acknowledge that God is the God of this day and that he is inviting us to step into his world. In fact, at one point Jesus said, if you're tired of religion, if you're tired and burned out, come to me. And he says, learn and do life with me. See, God's desire is for us to be with him. There's so many ways, right? The moment you get up, you go brush your teeth. Okay, you brush your teeth, and at that moment, you can begin to say, God, forgive me for using so many words yesterday that were not lovable, that did not represent you well, that I wasn't a good ambassador of your love and your grace and your mercy and your compassion because of the words that came out of my mouth. But also it's an opportunity for us to simply, as we're brushing our teeth, to ask God, God, Use my words today to bring life, to bring encouragement, to bring healing. As we shower, we, 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 we can ask God, cleanse our minds and cleanse our souls. Right? It's never ending. There's always an opportunity throughout the day as we take a sip. We can, we, we can say, God, give me a thirst for you. We can be in total communion with God throughout the day and have our thoughts fixed on him. And, and, and as Paul says, pray continually. But this is what I've learned. You know, Brother Lawrence back in the 1600s, he was a, 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 a lay brother in a monastery in France. He, he, he wrote a little amazing book called The Practice 
of the presence of God, which is actually what Isaiah said. Actually, Isaiah said that, you know, that we find peace in the presence of God, right? And he wrote this little book on prayer, and he talks about how he is constantly praying with God, and it's fascinating. But here's the thing. What I've learned is that we are, if we're not very, very intentional about carving out specific times in a regular rhythm to pause and to be still before God, and there, whether that means journaling our prayers, whether that means typing them on our notes, or whatever the case is, it is very difficult for us to be in communion with God throughout the day without having those anchor times in which we're stopping everything to revolve our lives around being in his presence. And that allows us to be able to face each day desiring and asking God to have our thoughts fixed on him, for us to be in communion with him, for us to be in dialogue with him, but also for us to learn to hear his voice like never before. As our thoughts are fixed on him, as we are carving out time throughout the day to be in his presence, it actually gets to a point where it's no longer so important what we're saying to him, but it's where we get to that place where we're actually now learning to hear his voice. After all, that's what Jesus said, right? My sheep know me, right? And they know my voice. They won't go to another shepherd because they know my voice. I'm afraid that many of us in all the we're living, we're not living in peace. First of all, because we don't even know that we desire peace. We desire circumstances to change over internal peace. And we don't have that peace either because we are so consumed with the voices from this world that we don't have the ability to hear the small, still voice of our Heavenly Father that wants to give us shalom, shalom, a perfect peace. So my prayer is that all of us, all of us would want the desire and would acknowledge that what we need is not just peace, but it is the God of peace. Let's pray. Heavenly gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you that your word is so clear, that your word describes our souls so clearly. And we ask that you will give us a hunger and a thirst for you because it is in you that we find perfect peace. It is in you that we can rest. It is in you, Lord, that we can fully be ourselves, that we can feel well about being in our skin so that we can truly be your ambassadors, so that we can truly be the beacon of light that you called us to be, so that we can truly be the salt and light that you've created us to be. But all that is an outflow of our lives being deeply rooted and centered and fixed on you, my King. We love you and we desire to adore you with our thoughts, with our hearts, with our strength, with our whole being. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.